as you make your way there, I'm sure you would have noticed that with Disney's recent purchase of the Star Wars franchise that there's been this renewed um, interest in the, the epic space story. Now, initially, George Lucas re released episodes four, five, and six, which trace Luke and Leia Skywalker's uh, journeys through an opposition to the Empire, which was led by the evil Darth Vader, who, spoiler alert, turns out to be their father. Now, in more recent years, uh, but at least long, long before, I think, at least half of our congregation was born, um, Lucasfilms released the far superior prequel trilogy, uh, episodes one, two, and three, which go back to before the fall of the Republic and trace the rise of Anakin Skywalker, who began as a good Jedi and then subsequently fell to the dark side when he became the mouth-breathing Darth Vader. So now Anakin, having started his journey as a, under dubious circumstances, he consistently finds himself butting his head against the uh, philosophy of the Jedi Council, which forbids attachment. He's unusually talented as a Jedi, but he's also narcissistic, extremely arrogant, and he harbors a secret love for Padme, uh, who is a senator in the Galactic Republic. And he and Padme subsequently get married secretly against the rules of the Jedi Council, and Padme later falls pregnant. Anakin then begins to have prophetic dreams about Padme dying in childbirth. And so he starts devising all sorts of plans to try and prevent this from happening. He at one stage goes to Master Yoda and he asks for counsel and he says, he explains his, his situation vaguely so that Yoda doesn't know what he's talking about and Yoda says, careful you must be when sensing the future Anakin, the fear of loss is a path to the dark side. So Anakin says, what must I do, Master Yoda? And Yoda says, train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. Now, Yoda and the Jedi accurately diagnose the problem. Anakin's misplaced passions and desires, which caused this all-consuming obsession and fear over losing Padme, trying to change the course of events of the future. Yoda got the diagnosis right, but the Jedi solution of letting go of everything that you fear to lose falls far short of the biblical solution. In our passage for consideration this evening in James chapter 4, we see the Apostle James addressing uncontrolled and misplaced desires and passions in the hearts and minds of the dispersed Jewish Christians, and he then points to these misplaced passions and desires as the cause for their ungodly behavior. The Jedi were supposed to be different because of their lack of attachment. And Christians are similarly called to be different to the unbelieving world around us. Whereas the Jedi were different by letting go of all attachments, Christians are different because of who we are attached to. So if you aren't already there, you can go to James chapter 4 and we'll be considering the first six verses. James writes, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? So as we consider how to wage war on worldliness, we'll do so under three broad headings. Uh, verses 1 to 3 speak about worldly passions and desires. Verses 4 and 5 speak about a worldly identity. And then finally, verse 6 speaks about heavenly grace. So worldly passions and desires, verses 1 to 3. James begins his warning by asking a question. He says, what causes fights, what causes quarrels, and what causes fights among you? And the assumption I think he's making is that fights and quarrels are not appropriate activities for the Christian church. The implication is clear that these fights and quarrels are a problem. I mean, he speaks about leading to stealing and murder, that's not appropriate for Christians, not at all. James is helping them to solve a serious problem here. 
In the preceding chapter, James describes heavenly wisdom, saying that it is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. A harvest of righteousness. So their goal, and ours by extension, ought to be a harvest of righteousness. That's the goal. The way that we reap a harvest of righteousness is by sowing peace. So let me ask you this question then. Do fights and quarrels lead to peace? No. No. Therefore, fights and quarrels also will not lead to a harvest of righteousness. The problem is, as we know all too well by our own experience, is that fights and quarrels do happen even among Christians. As someone who is looking for a harvest of righteousness in their own life, they ought to be asking themselves, why is it then that fights and quarrels occur? Why do these fights and quarrels occur even among Christians? James tells us why. He says that fights and quarrels occur because your passions are at war within you. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Now, at first glance, as we consider that, we might be tempted to conclude that the problem is passion and desire itself, just as Yoda does with Anakin. But we see clearly that this is not the case, because immediately after that, James says that their passions are at war within them, but they do not have because they do not ask. So you're following his logic here. The problem is not desire, it's not passions and desires in and of themselves. The problem is the direction of those passions and desires. Those passions and desires are very clearly at odds with the goal of obtaining a harvest of righteousness. This harvest is not produced because the passions and desires are not in line with reaping that harvest. Just as a farmer cannot expect to reap a harvest at the end of the year if he does not sow during the time of planting, at root, the problem here that James is trying to get at is a mismatch between what they say their desires are and what their actions reveal about their desires. You see, if their passions and desires were aligned and aimed at Christ, then there would be no war within them and consequently no war outside. James says, they do not have because they do not ask. So in this, he's clearly teaching that we need to acknowledge God as the giver of all things. Our desires, therefore, should be directed toward God rather than the things themselves. Their first problem was desiring the things themselves. However, just asking God to give us the things that we desire is no good. Desires must be in line with our ultimate goal of a harvest of righteousness. If we're asking for these things that will not help us to grow in holiness, that will not then lead to a harvest of righteousness, then we have no reason to expect that God will give them to us. The Bible is full of promises about God's blessings for obedience, even His physical, material blessings. One of the most astounding examples of this comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, which unequivocally states, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Did you hear that? You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. We must, however, reject the prosperity gospel which Tommy touched on this morning, in the sense that God is just giving us more idols to worship. Did you notice how in 2 Corinthians he gives the reason for the, for the enrichment? To be generous in every way. God will not enable our idolatry as long as we tick his religious boxes. It's this idea which makes the prosperity gospel so abhorrent. And yet it's so easy for us to live in such a way that we we show that we really believe that God ultimately desires our temporal happiness and comfort. It's so easy, isn't it, to pray like Aladdin treats his genie, rubbing the lamp and giving his shopping list. So where is your heart at? What are your consuming passions? What consumes your leisure time thoughts? Where do you spend your money and your time? What did your last session of prayer look like? 
What is drawing your affections away from where they ought to be, namely in the Lord Jesus Christ? What activities are you habitually engaging in that you know in your heart of hearts are not good, not healthy for your soul? James tells the Jews that they do not have because they did not ask. But he also says that when they do ask, they ask wrongly. Their wrong asking is clearly made wrong by the reason for their asking. They're asking for things to spend on their evil passions. So, lesson for us, when we ask for things, let's learn to pray for them biblically. Not only is our praying for things biblically effective, but it's also a very good check on our own hearts, forcing us to evaluate why we desire something. Come, let us reason together, God says. Well, let's take up that invitation and reason with God in our prayers. Do we want that new house in order to more effectively minister, in in order to more effectively raise a godly seed, to educate our children, create an environment of joy? Do we want to be more hospitable? Or do we want to appear more successful in the eyes of the world and lead a life that is more comfortable? Saints, as you suffer with that bodily affliction? Do you want to be delivered from that bodily affliction simply to lead a more comfortable life and enjoy a more comfortable retirement? Or do you want to be better equipped to spend yourself in service of God and His people? When we ask God for things, we ought to pray according to His will. And what is His will? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, your sanctification. Do your prayers reveal your desire for God and His glory, or do they just expose a heart that is all too easily dazzled and impressed with the world? So friends, as we ask for things, let's reason with God. As we ask for things, let's articulate in our prayers the ways in which we think these things will tend to our sanctification in line with the principles of godly love for our neighbor. So James, having drawn our attention to worldly passions and desires in verses 1 to 3, now highlights the danger of a worldly identity in verses 4 and 5. A worldly identity. Now, as is usually the case in the Christian life, the solution to the problem is not just simply for us to change our behavior. We need to go deeper than that. We need to find out what the root cause of these misplaced passions and desires really is. And James helps us to see in verses 4 and 5 that the problem is our identity. The problem is the way that we think about ourselves. You adulterous people, he says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell within us? Idolatry is spiritual adultery. Idolatry is no small matter, just as adultery is no small matter. When God institutes the covenant of marriage, he says in no uncertain terms that the two will become one flesh. Adultery is a ripping apart of that one flesh. And since marriage is a picture of Christ's relationship to his bride, the church, idolatry then is akin to adultery in that it tears that relationship apart. So it's not simply that we're just getting some minor points of religion wrong when we lose our distinctiveness from the world. Friendship with the world is enmity with God, James says. Enmity is a state or feeling of active hostility and opposition. The world is opposed to God. You cannot get cozy with the world without becoming like it. The more we are like the world, the less we are like God, by definition. We become like what we worship. The more we desire to be highly esteemed and respected by the world, the more we will compromise on sanctification and holiness. The more our passions and desires align with those of the world, the less we will admire and desire God. The more we allow the world to shape our thinking, the more strange and foreign will seem the law of God. The more we think like the world, the more we will allow the world's definitions to shape our own hearts. We'll begin to wonder then, what is the problem really with gay marriage and identity? We may wonder whether in the original Greek 
Paul really prohibits women from teaching and exercising authority over men. We'll begin to wonder whether fighting this abortion thing is really worth all the fuss. We'll start to believe, perhaps, that the use of the rod to discipline our children is maybe a bit harsh and old-fashioned. We might begin to neglect due process in establishing justice, or we might adopt niceness as the standard for godliness. We'll start to view the church not as a family, but as an institution. We may begin to think of those whom we have covenanted with, not as our brothers and sisters, but as members of a club. We will drool over and scheme to obtain that shiny new phone or that new gaming console or those pair of shoes or that car. We'll be really willing to risk marital disharmony over it. We'll be willing to spend unwisely to obtain it. Brothers and sisters, we cannot do this. We must refuse to foster or allow a friendship with the world. We must refuse to believe the lie that the world actually has something to offer us. Remember that the flesh still desires the things of the world. The flesh is still tempted by the fleeting desires and pleasures of sin, which means that if we are not constantly on our guard, if we are not constantly appealing to the Holy Spirit for His protection, if we are not constantly turning our thoughts and our meditation to the worth of God in the glory of Christ, we will naturally and inevitably become like the world. God is a jealous God, James tells us in verse 5. In our culture today, I think we often confuse jealousy and envy. Envy is sinful, jealousy is not. God is a jealous God. He is jealous over his bride, the church. That is, she is his alone, and he will not share her with another. So the thrust of verse 5, then, is that God does not want a people who look and behave just like the world. God's not satisfied with the people who are merely his in name only, but who hanker after other lovers. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 to 11, urges the Christian, saying, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. We belong to God, and this ought to make a difference in the way that we live and in the way that we think about ourselves and in the way that we think about the world. Our identity needs to be in Christ because we belong to God. Our God is a jealous God and because His Spirit dwells in us. Now, this is a mystery, this dwelling of God's Spirit within us, but Scripture is clear that the church is God's temple and that we are individually stones which make up this glorious temple in which God has chosen to dwell. God is willing to identify Himself with us, so we must not be divided in our passions and our desires. So, we ought to be aware of these worldly passions and desires. We must also guard against a worldly identity. But when we fail, as we almost always will, there is heavenly grace, verse 6. But he gives more grace. We may be those who fight and quarrel. We may be those who fail God by trying to form an identity in the world by giving in to the temptation to passionately desire those things which draw us away from Christ. We may be those who fall short daily of the glory of God. But praise God, He gives more grace. God is patient with idolaters and adulterous people. He is patient because He has made a way for us to be forgiven of our evil passions and desires, to be cleansed from our idolatry and reconciled to Himself. And he's done this by sending his perfect son to come to earth in human flesh and live a life with perfectly consistent Godward passions and desires. To live a life never desiring sin, never hankering after that which displeases the Father. And then he willingly gave up his life 
in order to take our sins upon himself so that everyone who confesses and repents of their adultery can be forgiven and reconciled to God. And not only does he reconcile himself to us through the Lord Jesus, but he also gives us more grace by sending his Holy Spirit to dwell within us, such that we are not only declared to be righteous in Christ as we are, but in order to conform believers to the image of Christ, such that we actually become righteous in space and time, such that we actually begin to have our passions and desires aligned with his passions and desires, such that believers are no longer at war within themselves and with one another, such that believers can no longer be called an adulterous people, a friend of the world and opposed to God. God is patient and God gives more grace and praise Him for that. But He will not be patient and gracious indefinitely. Today is the day of salvation. If you're aware of your own sinful passions and desires, if you see your own role in sinful quarrels and fights, if you realize that you have contributed to the sinful brokenness of the world around you, living in rebellion against the Holy God, then today is the day that God offers His grace. Humble yourself. Confess your evil passions and desires, pleading with God to change your heart and to redirect and strengthen your passions and desires such that you too can enjoy the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So Yoda was wrong. It's not the presence of desire or the fear of loss which makes us evil. Instead, it's that we desire the wrong things. And in the words of C.S. Lewis, indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. So family, let's embrace God's promise of grace. Let's leave behind our worldly passions and desires because they're far too small anyway. Let's fill our, our hearts with the only one who truly can fill them because he is big enough to occupy them, namely God himself. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are worthy. Thank you that you are desirable. Thank you that you are righteous, that you are holy, that you are powerful. Thank you that you are also just and merciful and that you are patient with us. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through the Holy Spirit. We thank you for making a way for us to be reconciled to you through Christ. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for our desires for the things of the world. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us for taking our eyes off you and so easily going back to that which you've saved us from. Lord, please will you help us to be those who would fill our minds and hearts with you. Help us to be those who would spend our lives and our, our energies in pursuing you. Pray, O oh Lord, that that would make a difference in the way that we behave. Pray, Lord, that the world would look at us and see the difference and that they would be attracted to you because they see how much you mean to us. Lord, please, would you do this for us as individuals and as a church? We pray this for your glory. Amen.